Today we're going to talk about a subject that many of you are very familiar with in concept. Some of you are familiar with this indeed. What we want to do is intensify in our church, this is our number one goal next year, to intensify the spiritual and practical impact of individuals, individual believers, through strategic relationships. So we're going to talk about strategic relationships today, but we're also going to go fishing. I'm fishing for people who want to invest in others, who will receive a little bit of training between now and the end of the year, and will invest in other people in various ways throughout next year as a mentor slash coach type person. So I'm fishing today for those, and I want you to open your ears to God speaking to you about doing this in your life and leveraging the experience and the maturity that you have into the life of someone else. We're going to talk about that in detail and how that happens through these wonderful uh, leaders in the church. So the first question that I have here is if you all would just maybe kind of introduce yourself so we can get familiar with you. And this is one of the things that we don't do enough of. We don't know one another enough in this church, and I want us to change that. So we're going to be much more intentional. So Lisa, why don't you start us off? Tell us about yourself. So I'm Lisa Gonzalez, and I work primarily with the middle schoolers and some with the high schoolers. Shout out to the middle schoolers. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I am married to Michael Gonzalez, uh, and we have two beautiful kids, Jacob and Zoe. Zoe's one year old. Jacob's three years old. Um, and I mostly stay home with them, and I work some as a nurse in outpatient surgery over in Brevard. So if any of you have surgery there, I'll probably get you ready and take you back after surgery. And I'm happy to be here today. Wonderful. Hannah? I'm Hannah Moody. I work at Summit Charter School in the middle school primarily. Um, I coach the girls' basketball team there. I have an eight-year-old boy who you will find after church a lot of times in the trees out front here, um, climbing high above, and he almost always has stains on his pants. Um, Okay, and you're working on a doctorate. And I am working on my doctorate. Uh, What is that exactly? What's your field of study? Um, I am getting my doctorate in curriculum and instruction, and I'm writing a dissertation on place-based education. Wow, cool. Jerry? Uh, I'm Jerry Blackburn, and my wife Mary and my daughter, Sarah Dancy, are out on a college tour right now, so my one visit to adult church, um, which they had been here to see. I'm typically over in uh, tech services and helping with the youth youth groups next door 99.9% of the time. And my wife Mary, of course, is... Wendy Lupus's sister, and they've got Grace Ware, who was what brought us up here about six years ago, and three beautiful children. Sarah Dancy is 17 and looking to go off to college soon, and Mo right here with my middle schoolers is 11, and Wade is somewhere in here beyond the lights, um, and he is our 14-year-old. I can't believe you put a plug in. That was awesome the way you worked that in. That's good. Grace Ware plug. That's good. Good for you. Black Friday. I didn't see that coming. I guess that's what happens when you don't warn people before the service about that. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, so here's the question, and I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask Jerry, this is a question for you. What are the three things that come to mind when you hear the word coach? As a coach, I always feel that you have somebody that's a leader, leading, um, leading your children to uh, build a discipline and a skill for whatever sport they happen to be in. I've coached soccer for about 35 more years now of all age groups, and you want to build a discipline in them, you want to build a skill in them, and develop some type of teamwork within them. Okay, what about you, Hannah? I feel like a coach is somebody who motivates me to be the best person I can be. Um, Someone who helps to improve a specific skill um, that is going to make my life complete, or on the court, my game complete. Very good. That's the first thing I want to point out to you all. I think if you think of a coach on a college level as someone who specializes in a certain position, you have a quarterback coach, a middle linebacker coach, you have a a defensive coach. Some of you today, if you sat here and took inventory, are specialized in a specific area. And And I think it's high time that we leverage that special experience. It could be in the business world, in the area of finance, in the area of communication. You could be a business consultant. You could be good at counseling with people. We'll talk more about these, but I want you to think specialty. Some of you are really good at helping new believers open up the Bible and get into the scripture. I want you to start thinking about what your specialty is because mentoring doesn't have to be a lifelong commitment. It can be a short-term season where you invest in someone else, and I think that's a good place to start. 
So let's think specialty. All right, Lisa, generally speaking, do most people live day to day thinking that they need a mentor or coach figure in their lives? I think that um, subconsciously they know that they may need some sort of guidance, uh, but day to day I think, you know, they may not think that they need a coach in particular until they're meet with a difficult, blah, met with a difficult circumstance and, you know, want some sort of guidance through that. All right, Jerry, do you sit around thinking, gee, man, I, if I just had a mentor coach, I don't, I don't think that way, do you? No, not at okay, all. Okay, why is that? I think just day-to-day -day lifestyle is just so busy. You've got your kids when you get home from work and you're working on homework or you're at soccer practice or basketball practice, wherever the next event is, and our day-to-day -day lives just keep us so busy that you don't have time to sit back and maybe think, wow, I wish if I had had this right now, maybe that somebody else could have helped. Okay. Hannah, besides what's been mentioned here, why do you think most adults do not really pursue are as open as maybe younger people are to having a mentor slash coach person in their life? I think if you are searching for a coach, you have to admit that there's an area in your life that you need to improve. And that creates a vulnerability that we're not comfortable with. Um, we like to create this Facebook perfect world where we have these pictures up and life is good all the time. In reality, it's not. But in order to seek out a mentor, seek out a coach, you've got to be willing to admit that I have flaws that need to be improved on. Okay, Lisa, if you had a relationship with someone who's trying to invest in you for a season, how could it go really wrong? What could, what could really not be a good experience? Um, well, trusting them and then they betray your confidence, talking about you to several different people. I mean, this is a small town where it gets around. Um, and I think that's the biggie here, um, just kind of betraying your confidence. Okay. Jerry, what five words would you use to describe what you feel like you would want to get from a coach-type figure in your life? You would want somebody that could give you some guardrails, um, put the light on your path before you. You know where you want to go, maybe you don't know how to get there. Um, somebody that gives you the self-confidence on that path as you're moving along. Um, you do lack the skills or you, you do have to be vulnerable and open up to them, so you, you hope that they can keep that trust and confidentiality amongst you. Okay. Are you all willing to be a little vulnerable here? This is enough. This is enough? That was, that was it? <laughs> okay, if we went to your loved ones and sat down with them and said, in what area would you specifically benefit from having some coaching, what would that area be? Hannah. Well, I can tell you that for sure, and I'll admit this because um, my mom's not here, but my mom would tell me that I need someone to teach me how to say no and to quit spread myself so thin. And because she's not here, I'll admit that she's probably right. Um, I say yes to almost every committee that I'm asked to be on. I say yes when pastor asks me, do I want to come and sit and talk in front of people on Sunday morning? Because because this is real comfortable. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I need someone to, to, in my life, to take the things when it gets way out of balance and way out of whack to bring me back to focus and, and to keep my river running, running narrow to my goal. A narrow river than a wide flood. Yes. Okay, good. Lisa, if we came to you and to your loved ones and said, how could someone help Lisa reach her potential, what areas would that, would that be in? Um, I think just kind of uh, having some sort of uh, guidance um, in the social aspect, because I'm not gonna lie, I can be socially awkward at times, and I think just having someone to kind of tell me like, you know, it's okay if you're, you know, not perfect in every way, um, and just to kind of coach me along and that and give me some practical advice. Okay, Jerry? Probably some uh, long-term planning type skills. Uh, again, I'm day-to-day -day and probably more reactive than I've been proactive. And so you'd want somebody to help with, um, especially with my financial world. It seems like finances are, again, just a reactive type thing day-to-day. -day. Um, so uh, long-term planning. Long-term planning, important. okay. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. So what does that mean to you? 
What does it mean to, what does that verse mean to you guys? Well, I think that um, the function of an iron um, when it's sharp is to, well, when you sharpen the iron so that it functions to the best of its ability. Um, so you use another piece of iron to do that. As we need people to hold ourselves accountable so that we can function to the best of our ability. Okay, so what if you didn't have another person sharpening you? What would you end up being? What, how would we describe you? Or anyone without a sharpening tool, what would we describe that person as being? You would become dulled. 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 And not shiny, not reflective, not changing, static, not being molded, not being shaped, not being reflective of anything, and really not fulfilling your purpose, which is to be sharp, right? Okay. In what area could you stand become sharper with the help of mentor coach? Okay, so sh short, long-term goals, balance. I didn't know that you really needed any help. You, you, like, you, to me, you're like just, like, you got it going on. But Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what happens when a person is receiving to an extent that they just become a sponge and they're not giving back out? What does that look like to y'all? Well, I can speak to that on a personal level. Um, this uh, fall has been one of the most stressful falls of my life. Um, I constantly stay busy. I have a very active eight-year-old son. Um, I teach. I am working on my doctorate. And then I decided to add some other things to my overwhelming life list. And I'm in the middle of buying my first home. And I was able to keep all of that pretty much on target. And then um, we found out in August that my son's father has cancer. And that really, um, he lives up on the mountain as well, but he doesn't have a lot of support. So I then became his main support system. And that final piece threw my whole life out of balance. And it has been a struggle um, this whole fall to get back in balance and to try to, I mean, I just feel like, you know, every day I wake up, I'm like, what am I supposed to be doing? Um, I forgot my kid twice. Don't, don't tell him, he doesn't know. <laughs> started to leave for our first basketball game and realized I uh, forgot my kid. So, <laughs> um, But that's what happens when you get out of balance and that your focus is everywhere and not centered on one particular thing. My wife and I were at Ingalls one day, and we were coming out of Ingalls, and we were talking. And we got in the car, and uh, we went to go home, and we pulled in the driveway and realized that Abigail was at Ingalls. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the so, only one who does that. Which I keep telling my kids, you get in the, gotta get in the car quicker, really. <laughs> it's not my fault. So we pulled in the driveway, and uh, we're getting out of the car and realized that we left our daughter. So it's not like she was teething or anything. <laughs> but the most embarrassing part of it is as we went back to get her, we ran into someone from the church who had picked her up. It's horrible, it's horrible. So not only am I a tailgater, I'm a neglector now in the community. Okay, so um, sometimes, sometimes we can get, and, and this is indicative of our culture. Now let's think about this. If we're always investing and receiving from other people and we're never giving back out, you end up with a generation of people that are narcissistic, selfish, egocentric, and feel like they're entitled. And we're not here to disciple a generation of people that feel that way or think that way. So for every bit that's poured into us, we need to give back out. So this is this relationship between mentoring and reverse mentoring. The old Pharisees had the old teaching of the Dead Sea. If you've been to Israel, everything pours in, nothing pours out, and nothing's alive in it. It's static, dried up, salty, brackish water that's good really for nothing except for putting mud on your face at $20 a pound or whatever they sell it for. So, so not only is this relationship where we need to have a mentor coach in our life, we also need to get rid of. And, and as I said before, you really don't have anything until you give it away. That's what solidifies you having received it to begin with. And here's another thing, you're really not under, you don't really walk in authority until you're under authority. Okay, so this is where that divide, this divide comes up. He says, well, I don't know that I'm willing to have someone in my life that can encourage me and, and, and instruct me and counsel me on things. Well, you're going to have difficulty doing that on the other end, too. Um, 
my daughter was telling me about the, uh, she was at Lee University, and in the chapel they had this uh, illustration that they had this big sponge, and, they, and they, they used the sponge to soak up a bunch of milk, and then they put it in a plastic bag, and a week later they opened the bag. And she said on the 10th row they could still smell it. Their point was, if you're always just soaking something up and never giving anything away, you're going to stink. We can't have that. We have to have this flow of grace in and out of our life. Um, let's take some examples. We have opportunities coming up for uh, people who are financially capable, probably made some mistakes in that area, got on the biblical train to understanding the correct understanding of money, investing, spending, saving, giving, who want to lead a small group next year in January, a crown ministry group. That's, that's an opportunity for 12 weeks to pour back into someone else's life. I like the idea you've made mistakes, and I've made mistakes. We capitalize on those, and we show other people how not to do it. Financial counseling. We have people down at the market who could understand they need basic, simple principles on a family budget, how to put stuff together, how to, how to give back to the kingdom of God. These are the things that need to happen. And we can talk and sing and worship all day long, but at the end of the day, we've got to put feet on these things. Faith without works is dead. So if that's you, you've got this. If you're a business-minded man or woman who spent your whole career building businesses, small businesses, CEOs, large corporations, we are forming teams of people now who will go out into our local communities as a team of consultants and show local businesses and regional businesses how to shore up themselves how to put budgets together, how to read a spreadsheet, and bring Christ into those relationships. We also have an international team that's going to do that in other nations where businesses are being planted to further the kingdom of God with the revenue. Those are the type of things. If, you have a, if that's your bailiwick and that's your, that's your thing, you've got a place here to serve. If you're struggling financially, and every time we take the offering, you've got this grimace on your face like, I have nothing to give. You do have something to give. We just need to manage what you have better. We need people that can do that. And we have people that are doing that. That's very important. A mentor relationship doesn't have to be forever. It could be 90 days. It could be 60 days. And it, and it can start with the word coffee. When I solicit your information today on those who are willing to specialize in a specific area, it's nothing more than starting a conversation with someone else in the church over a cup of coffee to see if it's a good fit, to see what kind of time you want to invest, to see if it's going to be something that you want to pursue. I had someone who's, I think, they said they were, someone said they were 80 the other day, and they said, well, how am I going to get a mentor? Mentors aren't always age-specific. I know a lot of people in this church who could really stand to have a younger mentor to teach them about software and computers and social media who need to communicate with their grandchildren but can't for a lack of knowledge. So there's, there's always a skill set. If you look at where you're weak, like you've, you've mentioned some weaknesses here. If you look at where you're weak, someone else is strong, and that iron will sharpen you. You just need, and I need, the humility to say, would you help me? We're going to try to form those strategic relationships called Mentor Reverse Mentoring at Community Bible Church in Highlands, North Carolina, for the glory of God. You have something to offer. And you need a relationship, and I do too, to be in that means something, a relationship with purpose. So as you look over and you've thought about this, and we've prepared these questions and talked about them, what do you see, Lisa, younger kids needing, from, not only from their parents, but in appropriate relationships with people their parents are aware of, to help invest in them? What do they need that they, they, they maybe aren't getting from their parents for whatever reason? Well, Lisa, let's start with you. Well, this wasn't on the list, so let me think really quick. Um, I think that the younger generation just needs, uh, well, I think time equals love to the younger generation. So I think that if you show interest in them, like, hey, how are you doing? Or just make them feel like they're significant, um, that they're not just a kid, you know, in middle school. They're, you guys are kind of growing up. And I think from the older generation, they just need to know that we care about them, that they're important, they're significant. 
we love them, and that we're here for them. If they need a listening ear, if they need anything, that we will drop it and we'll be right there for you. So. Okay. Hannah, as a school teacher, how, do you, how would you answer that question? Um, I agree a lot with what Lisa said. Our kids need um, people invested in them. Um, our kids need someone who can look them in the eye and be real and know that they are genuinely there because they love them, they care about them, and that, um, you know, I know middle school is full of these awesome struggles, and I want to be there to help you guys as y'all maneuver the crazy waters that are middle school. Um, and more people in the church can be there for our middle school kids, for our high school kids. They're going through so much, and having someone that is just intentionally there um, that will be real with them and look them in the eye and say, I love you no matter what, and I'm here for you, and we will get through it together. Okay, Jerry, what about you? You have kids. What, what would you like to know is taking place in their life that is supporting and augmenting what it is you're trying to do as a parent? Oh, I think a lot of it is that uh, it takes somebody that can listen to their needs. We can all tell the children what they need, or as a parent, or as an educator, or a coach, you can be caught on one line of thought trying to talk to and teach to, but sometimes you need to sit back and listen to their reaction, their interaction, and see what it is they're really wanting, what is it that they, they really need. Excellent. All right, let's pull this handout out and we'll wrap this thing up. List three areas of strength you can pass on to someone. So you, you got to, in Galatians the other day in the men's group, we were looking at this thing. It's okay to have pride in yourself. There is a right kind of pride to have in yourself and you really have to acknowledge, hey, listen, what is it that I have to offer that other people would really benefit from? I want you to write that down. I want you to think about that. What do I have to offer? You could be um, a really good biblical teacher. I don't care if you make flower arrangements and you're really good at it. It doesn't really matter, but what is it that you're really strong in that you have to offer that will build up someone else in the process as you instruct them and help them in that area? You might have some counseling background, teaching background. You may want to facilitate a small group. We want to go from 19 to 34 groups next year. We're going to need people to do that, okay? You're a facilitator, a networker. You're a career counselor. I don't know what you've been doing in parts of your life. You've run a small business. I want you to write that down. What is it you're really good at? And then in their book, Connecting Paul Stanley and Robert Clinton, outlines seven different kinds of mentoring roles to help us properly match you with someone. Please circle one or two of these roles of which you feel you are best suited. One is a director type person. Personal career direction, accountability, insight for maturation. If you know how to help somebody or you want to further what you know about help somebody understand, identify calling, vocation, uh, that's important. A consultant, it's a mentor on call, it's support kind of decisions are made to help way, who knows you well enough to say, are you making the right decision? We're not trying to match people up with others who are gonna make decisions for you. That's not what this is about. To help you understand and weigh out what is good, sound decision making in your life. And I know a lot of people that are paralyzed by making decisions. And they come into the office and say, will you tell me what I need to do? And the answer is no, this is your life. You need to make that decision, but let's weigh it out appropriately. That's a consultant type person. A coach type person who will help you in crisis, navigate illness, grief counseling, people who have, what have you been through? What testimony, what horrible season of life have you made it through? What illness have you overcome? Uh, for instance, we, have, we just had someone in the church lost a child. 20 plus year old child to a motorcycle accident. And then we have another couple in the church who also lost a son at the very similar age. Those two people need to be together. Even as elders, we're gonna start looking at elder prospects and match up with one another. Carter Miller and I are talking about this, of helping one another through this process. Addictions, sponsors for those who are trying to overcome addictions. I'd like you to fill this out. I'd like you to say, you know what, I might be a prospect on that. Relationships, grief care I mentioned, um, a networker, a resourcer, someone who knows enough in the church about what other people have been through that they could maybe recommend a matchup on one particular area. I'd love for you to fill out your name and email so that we can be in touch with you and we're going to actually send you an application, sort of do a vetting process to make sure you're at a right season of life to do this with someone else give you a little bit of training, and as we get into next year, put you to work. 
put you to work helping that other woman. Have a cup of coffee. I want to see people having coffee all over the mountain just talking about, what did you learn about your business? I did this the other day. I, I matched two people up, and I knew that they could probably at least cry in each other's coffee or, or help one another somehow. I don't know what. But this is important. We want to intensify the spiritual and practical impact of believers through strategic relationships. Can I and say something really please, quick? Please, yes. Um, a lot of times I think we feel like we need to have it all together before we start mentoring or giving, but we don't have to have it all together. I think that just makes us more relatable to whoever we're mentoring. Um, and a little while back, I was just not pouring out and I felt stagnant and complacent and just in a place of compromise. I just, I hated it. You know, when you're not being challenged and um, I thought in my mind I had to have it all together to, before I started giving back. And I was like, you know, I'm just gonna take a leap of faith here and just start pouring out. And the more I started pouring out, I felt like God was even filling me up even more. And we're not, like God created us to give. We're created in his image and he's a giver. He gives everything. He gave his son. And so give, you know, just take that leap. If you're struggling in your mind um, in a certain area, just take that leap and, and give of yourself because you're going to grow and the person that you're mentoring is going to grow. Um, anyway, yeah. So we were talking the, the other day, we had a meeting, we were talking about, I said, Lisa, in what area could you maybe use some help? She says, really communicating to others. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> okay, whatever. <laughs> if you have that piece of paper and you say, I'm not ready to invest in someone else just yet, many opportunities will present themselves in the very near future for you to identify an area where you would need some help. Well, go ahead and write that down on the piece of paper. I could really use some help in this area. We'll begin this process of identifying with the staff of the church how we're going to make this one of our number one priorities in the church. So think about that. Not only today, but in the weeks ahead. Turn that in so we can contact you.